Rayanne Miller was missed, although her husband was only away for three days on a business trip. Sitting at her desk, waiting for the end of the day and week, Millie walked up and asked, I know this is probably a waste of time, but would you like to come with us after work for dinner, drinks and dancing? It was an offer that Ray Ann had turned down many times before. She always wanted to go, but her husband didn't approve. She and Joel used to go dancing often in the early years of their marriage. But over time, Joel began to worry that Ray Ann, dancing closely with horny men after a few drinks, might engage in inappropriate behavior more than once. As the evenings went on and the effects of the drinking intensified, Ray Ann became more and more flirtatious and less and less rebuffed. Plus, Joel especially didn't trust Todd, the womanizer who worked with Ray Ann. Joel almost got into a physical fight with Todd at a company Christmas party when he kept stopping to dance with Ray Ann every time slow music played. From Joel's point of view, Todd was trying his best to cling to Ray Ann, despite her efforts to resist, which were becoming increasingly weak. Ray Ann thought, Joel is out of town. He wouldn't want me to go, but I'm his wife, not a slave. I don't need to ask his permission. I asked him before if it would bother him if I went out with my colleagues, and he told me his opinion. He never said I couldn't go. Anyway, he won't even know if I will go out this time. Not so much if I'm going to a party every weekend. Joel needs to trust me more. I know my drinking limit, and I know what Todd and men like him will try to achieve. I can handle his tactile advances. Plus, there will be a lot of people there to help keep an eye on me. She surprised Millie by saying, You know, I'd really like to go tonight. Can I come with you and ask you to give me a ride back here to pick up my car? Although Ray Ann felt a little mischievous for accepting the invitation, her excitement overcame her sense of danger. Millie suggested, Okay, come with me. If you're too drunk to drive home, I'll take you home and you can take a taxi back tomorrow to pick up your car. Don't worry about me getting drunk. I know my limit. She didn't realize that her usual limit was based on her previous history of drinking a couple of times a week. She hadn't drunk any hard alcohol at all in months, so the amount of booze it took to get her drunk had decreased. The group gathered from work at Barney's. There were four women and only two men. Todd was one of them. They ate first and then headed to a table near the dance floor. Ray Ann was wary of Todd, but he paid little attention to her at first, since Josh, the other of the two men, was not a fan of dancing. Todd seemed to act like a gentleman, taking turns dancing with all the women without paying more attention to one than the other, except for Ray Ann. He paid almost no attention to her. She was getting irritated because she loved to dance and Todd was a good dancer. Ray Ann even began to feel a little jealous of the attention the other women were getting from Todd. This was part of his plan. Todd also acted like a good host and made sure everyone had fresh drinks and was not shy about drinking himself. He drank Bloody Marys, although no one else knew that most of them were non-alcoholic Bloody Marys. Ray Ann had reached her self-imposed limit and was feeling a little perky when she asked Todd if he was even going to ask her to dance. He emphasized by saying, Since you ask. Todd led Ray Ann onto the dance floor. It was a fast song and they danced well together without touching each other. They stayed on the dance floor. After another fast song, a slow one started playing. Todd gently took her into his arms, being careful not to hold her too close. Ray Ann wondered if Todd had finally learned that she was immune to his charm. She let her guard down. Gradually, they became closer. Even though Todd's body felt nice against hers, Ray Ann still felt in control, so she wasn't worried. They returned to the table. Ray Ann had one drink over her limit and danced with some other men. When the next slow dance began, Ray Ann was looking for Todd. He walked up without saying a word, and they began to dance as close as at the end of the last slow dance. He led her to a spot on the dance floor farthest from where the group could see. This time, Ray Ann felt his excitement. She felt herself getting aroused as well. Feeling protected by being among a large group of people, Ray Ann allowed herself to enjoy temporary intimacy. When the dance ended, they looked at each other. Todd pulled her close and kissed her. Although she instinctively kissed back, she quickly recovered. Damn, he almost got me after all. 
They returned to the table. Ray Ann stopped dancing and drank her drink more slowly. In any case, it was time to leave. When the other woman decided to use the restroom, Ray Ann stood up to go with them. Todd grabbed her hand and told her he needed to talk to her about a work-related problem. She had no idea that this would be the most important decision of her life. Ray Ann stayed. As the women returned to the table, Todd suggested to Ray Ann that they go to the ladies' room so they could leave when everyone was ready. Ray Ann splashed water on her face and blamed herself for not paying attention to Todd's temptations. It was time to go home. Tomorrow night, Joel will benefit from the excitement I'm feeling right now. She returned to the bar. Ray Ann was surprised that no one from the office was at the table. Looking around the dance floor, she didn't see anyone from the group there. She soon saw Todd bring two new drinks to the table. Where is everyone, Todd? They said they were ready to leave, so I told them to go. But Millie was my traveling companion home. I told her I would take you home. I'm not drunk, so you'll be safe. Well, then, let's go. Ray Ann was a little angry. Todd countered, I just bought these drinks for us before everyone decided to leave. At these prices, I don't want to waste them. Please sit down. After one drink, I promise I'll take you home. Ray Ann was outraged, but sat down. She took a few sips. It was a strawberry decury, her favorite. Okay, I'm not driving and I can sleep tomorrow. What the hell? Halfway through the drink, Ray Ann realized she was in trouble. She mumbled, What's in this drink? She tried to stand up, but was unsteady. Todd wrapped his arm around her to steady himself. When he got out, Todd assured her that he would take her home safely. On the ride home, Ray Ann began to feel very horny. She knew that she needed to be with her husband, but he was not there. But there was another handsome man. I like the way we danced today, Todd. You were nice. She placed her hand on his thigh, and he did the same with hers. Soon, Ray Ann was stroking his thigh and brushed against his bulge. She laughed. Did I cause it? Do you see other beautiful, sexy women here? Todd asked. How many naked men have you ever seen? Ray Ann pretended to be shocked by the question, but replied, Not much. Want to see me? That would be very flirty. She laughed. It will just be something to see. You might be surprised at the difference between what I have and what other men you've seen. When she didn't object, he said, Here, I'll help you. Todd unbuckled his belt and lowered his pants and underwear. Ray Ann knew she should have objected, but she couldn't bring herself to. Instead, she just watched and said, This is really good. I've never seen anything like this. It's okay if you touch it. I will. I really shouldn't. Todd took her right hand and placed it on himself. They soon reached Ray Ann's house. As Todd parked the car in the driveway, he turned to Ray Ann and began kissing her passionately. She responded to the kiss no less passionately. Soon he began to caress her. Ray Ann shuddered at his touch. No, she whispered, but her body said, yes. The hands of both lovers began to move violently. Todd asked, can we go in where no one can see us? Ray Ann agreed, and all pretense about what was going to happen disappeared as soon as they entered the house. The biggest question was whether they would make it to the downstairs bedroom before they started having sex. Over the course of the night, they tried a number of sex positions. Ray Ann was insatiable. They were both exhausted. Ray Ann quickly fell asleep. Todd, proud of himself, soon followed. When Ray Ann woke up, she saw that she was home but not in the master bedroom. Her headache was painful, and different parts of her body ached. When she brought this into view, Ray Ann began to cry. Oh my God, what happened to me? Then she saw Todd lying next to her. He woke up from her screams. What are you doing here? Leave, leave. Ray Ann, calm down, it's just me, Todd. So we had a little too much and ended up in bed. Not a big deal. God, you were so horny last night. What? How did I end up in bed? Who stripped me? What did you do to me? Having discovered her nakedness, she covered herself with a blanket. Hey, I didn't do anything to you that you didn't want. In fact, most of the time you begged me. So don't pretend that I took you by force. 
I have a video that shows how you really wanted it. I will show this to your husband if you dare to accuse me of anything. He was bluffing about the video, but Ray Ann didn't know that. Oh my God, leave, just go away. Okay, but remember what I said. After you've thought about it for a while and want to try again, just let me know. Todd was confident that his plan had worked perfectly. There was no way she would risk her marriage by blaming him. Ray Ann was beside herself. She thought she was going crazy. As soon as she remembered that Joel wouldn't be coming home for a while, she called her sister. Angela, something terrible happened. I need your help. Come here now. Angela said she was on her way. Angela arrived and hugged her sobbing sister. Between her hysterical sobs, Angela heard as much of the story as she could make out. Ray Ann raised the issue of sex and blackmail videos. Angela insisted on reporting the rape and sending her rapist to prison. Angela had been in a similar situation before and did not report to the police. She regretted this ever since and considered it the reason for her inability to establish a loving relationship with a man. Ray Ann, as always, deferred to her older sister. As she prepared her sister to go to the ER, Angela called Joel. He answered in a sleepy voice. What? Who is this and why are you calling so early in the morning? Joel, this is Angela. You need to get home as soon as possible. I'm taking Ray Ann to the hospital now. What? How did this happen? Tell me. Can't say much right now. I need to take her to the emergency room. All I know is that it involves going out to see some co-workers from the office at a place called Barney's and some guy named Todd. Joel screamed in his head. Damn, Todd. Damn. I warned her. Damn it. Joel began to get ready to leave as soon as possible. This did not make sense since he could not leave earlier than the already scheduled flight. If he had rented a car, he would have arrived home two hours later than his flight. He had a lot of time to be angry, and he really is angry. I told her. She just needed to get out. She knew what Todd wanted, and he got it, damn it. I wonder how hard it was to get into her panties. Probably just a couple of cocktails and knowing I was gone. Hell, for all I know, they could have been doing this for a long time. After all, I wasn't gone for long. Why couldn't she wait three days for me to come back? Maybe she got what she deserved. Damn, my marriage is completely ruined now, and we were going to start a family. Joel was so focused on Ray Ann going against his warnings and whether she might have enjoyed the sex that he had little time to think about how she might have gotten hurt. His anger increased when the flight was delayed. Joel was sure the plane had been hovering on the runway for an hour before takeoff. He then seemed to be surrounded by crying babies who suffered as the pressure in their ears became uncomfortable. Joel has become the adult version of the kid who constantly asks, Are we there yet? He was sure that his bag was the last one on the conveyor belt. He then almost threw money at the guy in the parking lot. His self-talk consisted mostly of four-letter words. Joel's volcano was ready to erupt by the time he reached the emergency room. He showed no manners when asking where his wife was. She was now in a regular room, and he ran to the elevators. Apparently the squirrels that powered the elevators were taking a break for nuts, so Joel had to wait even longer in front of the elevator. Finally, he arrived at room 532. Ray Ann was sitting in bed. She started crying as soon as she saw Joel. Angela stood next, to her. Joel stopped at the foot of the bed and shouted, What the hell happened? Ray Ann began to cry even more, and Angela walked around the bed and stood face to face with Joel. Is this the first thing you want to say to your wife who has suffered mental trauma? You bastard! Aren't you interested in how she feels? Sorry, how are you, Ray Ann? Are you feeling any pain? Oh, Joel, that was terrible. Please come here and hold me. I missed you so much. Joel hesitated. Angela was ready to push him when he finally came over. He stood next to her bed as she wrapped her arms around him. Joel acted like he didn't know what to do with his hands. Angela noticed his concern. What the hell is wrong with you? Your wife is suffering and you act like she has leprosy. Joel began to tear up. I just can't stop thinking about the fact that the last person who held her, who kissed her, who made love to her, was that bastard Todd. I warned her. I warned her. And yet she went. She knew what to expect and went anyway. 
Looking down at his wife, he asked, So are you glad you went out with company now? Ray Ann let Joel go. Happy? You think I'm happy with getting fucked? I'm sorry I was so selfish that I thought it would be okay to have a little fun. I thought nothing would happen with so many people around. Joel, like me, could I have known that he would put something on me? I still don't remember what happened after we left the bar. I was in complete shock when I woke up this morning with, Don't you understand? It's not my fault. It's not your fault? If you hadn't gone as I told you, would this have happened? All I know is that it's not your husband's fault. Ray Ann didn't answer. Joel continued. What are you going to do? Angela intervened. It's already been reported to the police. DNA tests will be done to prove it was Todd. Hopefully they'll push him to the wall. Trial? Great. His lawyer will portray you as an approachable woman, and we will be humiliated even if he is convicted. Angela was furious. She walked up to Joel and punched him in the face. Creature! Your wife was in shock, and all you care about is your humiliation. How dare you hint that she... Oh, go away, you idiot! Go away! Ray Ann said, No, I want my Joel. Angela responded, That's not your Joel. Your Joel would be here and on your side. This creep just wants to show off. Say, I told you so, like a kid in elementary school, and complain about how his macho reputation has suffered. He makes me glad I never got married. Joel left. As angry as he was at Ray Ann for ignoring his warnings and going out with her co-workers, he was shocked to learn that she was on to something. It began to eat away at his assumption that everything was her fault. However, he kept coming back to the thought, but if she hadn't gone at all, this would never have happened. Joel returned home and put his clothes from the trip in the wash and made himself a sandwich. It was strange being in the house without Ray Ann. He snatched the sandwich and cried. He cried for a long time. The next morning at the hospital, the police officer who took Ray Ann's statement about the incident told her that it appeared Todd had left town. A warrant will not be issued for his arrest until it is determined whether the DNA from Ray Ann's semen matches the DNA taken from Todd during his arrest several years ago. In the meantime, they were going to look for him as a person of interest. Police questioned Ray Ann's willingness to testify against Todd if it came to that. Angela was upset that Ray Ann hesitated before answering that she agreed. Ray Ann explained that it would be difficult for her to testify if Joel did not support her. The officer asked her to think about it. There was no need to make a decision until the DNA results showed it was Todd. Joel wasn't a drinker until that day. He didn't even know a good place to drink. He knew where he didn't want to go, Barney's. The bar he found offered nothing but popcorn and pretzels, so the beer affected him faster than usual. By the time the bartender refused to serve him, he had nearly passed out. Even though his head hurt, part of him felt pretty good when he woke up. Joel slowly realized that someone was satisfying him. Oh, Ray Ann, this is so good. Thank you, dear. Exactly. Suddenly, a naked female figure flashed in front of him, heading to the bathroom. Joel heard her start vomiting into the toilet. Sorry, baby. No problem, honey. The voice was not Ray Ann's. Who? Who are you? Damn, when I thought I was unforgettable. My name is Evie, you know, like the first temptress of man. Eve. Where are we? How did we get here? What were we doing? It looks like you were so drunk. Okay, here's the info. Days in. I basically dragged you drunk to your room. We had sex like animals. You owe me $250. What? I don't understand. I don't care what you understand. Give me $250 so I can go home. I need to sleep before I go back. To work. Are you... Are you a prostitute? Hell no. I'm from Rent-A-Wife. Our one-night stand just ended in divorce. God, why do all the stupid people come to me? Come on, hand over the cash, John. No checks, no credit cards. I don't have that much cash. I know. I looked in your wallet. You do, however, have a bank card. We can just go to the nearest ATM and take my money. You better get dressed first. Listen. 
I don't know what you're trying to do. I have never paid for sex and never will. I'm a happily married man. He cringed as he thought about the current state of his marriage. You say you are married and have never paid for sex? Ha! What do you think marriage is? Look, I don't care what you did before or not. If I don't get $250 from you as soon as possible, Tyrell, my pimp will cut off your dignity, your choice, money, or become a eunuch. Joel got dressed and went down to his car. Evie followed him as closely as possible in her five-inch heels. Joel got into his car and quickly locked the door. He smiled and waved to Evie as he drove away. Evie didn't seem upset. She was not. She had his driver's license to give to a big Alberta collection agency. Joel returned home and took painkillers. He thought about calling or visiting Ray Ann, but his thoughts were too conflicting to know what to tell her. Although his feelings for his wife were mixed, his thoughts about Todd were absolutely clear. Revenge. Joel sent an email to his boss asking for time off due to a family emergency. He wasn't sure how long it would take. Joel called Angela and told her to take Ray Ann to her home. He was not yet ready to live in the same house with her. Joel had to hang up when Angela launched a stream of insults, many of which disparaged his courage and background. As Joel contemplated various scenarios, including Todd's murder, Todd being seriously injured, running away, divorce, a messy trial, mental health care for both him and Ray Ann, he had an idea. He called his lawyer and was referred to a divorce lawyer known for preserving his client's assets. After consultation with a lawyer, the documents were drawn up and were withheld for now. Ray Ann's planner had addresses and phone numbers at the end. There was a section for her colleagues, including everyone's mobile number. Todd's number was on the list. The prefix was a commonly used local Verizon number. Joel called his cousin who worked for Verizon. He asked if she could tell if someone was a Verizon customer. She said she could. He then asked if she could locate the phone if it was a Verizon phone. The cousin quickly realized where this was going and informed Joel that she had no right to do such things. Joel told her that Todd had screwed his wife, whom she had met at family gatherings. The cousin began to cry. She soon confirmed that Todd was a Verizon customer but had just canceled his old service. Joel was upset. The cousin continued, How about I connect your phone to his current phone so you can find his location? Joel responded, If you do this, I promise not to come between you and Grandma's chocolate pie at Thanksgiving. Bastard. Love you too, bitch. They both laughed. About 20 minutes later, Joel received the location of Todd's new phone. It was several hours away. He returned home and picked up his aluminum softball bat. Before he left, he made two calls. He told his lawyer to send the documents. Then he called Ray Ann. Angela almost refused to let him talk to her. Joel, can I come home, honey? Please, I need you. I'm sorry I didn't listen to you. Please forgive me. Ray Ann, you can come home, but I may be gone for a while, maybe even longer. Look, there is something very important that you have to do. You have to promise me to do it. I'll do whatever you say. What do you want me to do? Some documents will arrive for you soon. It hurt him to say this. These are divorce papers. No, no, not a scam. Please, not this. Please trust me. These are not ordinary divorce papers. What you must do is sign them quickly and return them to my lawyer as soon as possible. No, please don't ask me for that. Anything but that. You have to trust me on this. It's what's best for both of us. You have to do it if you want anything good to come out of our lives. I don't understand. In time, you will understand. It is important that you trust me and do what I ask. Okay. I know you love me no matter what. I'll sign the papers. Ray Ann, never doubt that I do this out of love. It's so good to hear that. When will I see you again? Soon, but not right away. Are you leaving somewhere? It's better that you don't know that. You're not going to do anything stupid, are you? I hope not, but that remains to be seen. I've said too much. I have to go. He hung up. Angela inquired about the content of the conversation. When Ray Ann told her about the call, Angela was furious again. Ray Ann, don't you dare sign anything. 
Here, this is the name and number of a good divorce lawyer. Call him as soon as you get the papers. I don't know what kind of crap he's trying to pull, but I won't let my sister get scammed. Around this time, the home phone rang. Ray Ann ran up to him and replied, Joel, is that you again? A male voice answered, That's not Joel. I don't know where the hell Joel is and I don't care. I'm interested in Joel or someone else bringing me $300 tomorrow. What? I'm his wife. Who are you and why does he owe you $300? I'm a pimp who finds women for men willing to pay for their company. Joel's bill was $250, but I added a late fee. He had sex with my girlfriend, Evie, but didn't pay. I got his address from his driver's license, and trust me, he doesn't want Big Albert coming to his house for a visit. He can bring the money to the bar where he picked up Evie. Tell him the longer he waits, the higher the bill will be. He hung up. Angela asked, who was it? It was a man who said he was a pimp and wanted money from Joel for sex with one of his women. Do you think it was a prank? I don't think so. It sounded real to me. What are you going to do? Give me the goddamn number of a divorce lawyer. Joel arrived at the location indicated by Todd's phone. He saw a car in the parking lot with a garage parking sticker that matched his wife's. He knew Todd was here. Quickly thinking about what to do next, Joel decided that the best thing to do would be to beat Todd to a pulp and call the police, who he hoped would arrest Todd for what he had done to his wife. He took his baseball bat and hid it behind his back. He walked up and rang the doorbell. Who's there? Asked a voice from behind the door. Publisher's Clearinghouse. The voice answered excitedly. Joel thought that he would have to knock down the door since no one could be stupid enough to open it. Right before Joel was about to kick down the door, he found out that Todd was stupid enough to open it. Joel came in and started throwing some serious punches at Todd. Joel paused. Todd, if you ever want to sleep with a married woman again, you better tell me the truth about what you did to my wife. With blood in his eyes, Todd didn't recognize Joel and answered in a nasal voice. What was she like? Ray Ann, you bastard. Oh, damn, you're Joel. Okay, okay, I'll tell you if you'll stop hitting me. I'll stop hitting you when you start talking. He sphinxed the blow with the bat. Okay, I spiked her drinks. In the last drink, I slipped her some illegal substance. It didn't take long before she started clinging to me. I wasn't sure if it was from the drinks or if she really wanted me. After Joel was satisfied with Todd's story, he said, I lied. Let's start. Joel began hitting Todd. Neighbors looked inside to see the chaos. More than one cell phone recorded the event. Joel turned to the onlookers, causing them to flinch in fear. He simply said, Call 911. Ask for an ambulance and the police. Someone said, It's already done. Joel walked further inside and sat down in the rocking chair. He reached for the now open bottle of beer and took a sip. With a feeling of great relief, Joel waited. Ray Ann made an appointment with a divorce lawyer. Later, she began to wonder if she had acted too hastily. You can always stop. If Joel doesn't talk to me, I'll tear up his papers and let mine pass. Angela congratulated her sister on finally taking control of her life. Burn the bastard became Angela's mantra. Rayanne received a call from the police with an important update. I have a lot to tell you. First, the DNA matched Todd Hargrove. Second, before we could issue a warrant, I received a call from the Springfield Police Department. They said they had a madman who beat a guy named Todd. The madman claimed that Todd was wanted by us. We didn't take it seriously until he threatened us with a bat. He promised to come with us quietly if we made one call. That's why I'm calling you. I told him we were issuing a warrant for Todd's arrest. Third, the crazy man the officer was talking about is Joel. He was arrested for serious assault, unlawful confinement, and making terroristic threats. Joel will be in the Springfield jail for now. Todd will be in the hospital for quite a long time. Ray Ann was stunned. Joel followed Todd. But did that mean he believed my story about what happened? Undoubtedly, yes. She agreed with Angela to go visit Joel. Before they left, she was served with divorce papers. Angela wanted to throw them away, 
but Ray Ann wouldn't let her until she had read them herself. They weren't what she expected. She was afraid of what they might mean. Angela looked at them and suddenly realized what Joel might be planning. Ray Ann insisted on signing them and sending them to Joel's lawyer. Joel remained calm in prison. He still felt good about what he had done. Joel was a little shocked to learn that he had earned the respect of the other prisoners. Todd was still in the hospital, but more than one inmate promised Joel that they would support his plan to kill Todd when he was sent to prison. Joel thanked them. Joel whiled away the time as best he could. He sent a letter to his employer, apologizing for leaving without notice. Joel asked to send Ray Ann the salary that was due to him. He didn't ask for a job back or a good recommendation. Joel had no idea how long he would be sentenced. He didn't care. Ray Ann's letter was too complicated. He wanted to support her, but it was hard for him not to say, I told you so is literally or almost literally. He was informed of the DNA match and the charges against Todd. Joel laughed when he realized what a mess he would have been in if the DNA hadn't matched and Todd hadn't been charged. His assumption was damn bold. It's too late to worry about it now. Joel never sent the letter to Ray Ann. The day came when Ray Ann and Angela visited Joel in prison. Hey, Ray Ann. Hey, bitch from hell. Ray Ann started talking. Joel, please. How are you? I signed the papers. I was afraid you were going to kill yourself. Angela predicted you were going to kill Todd. Sorry to disappoint you, Angela, but guessing that I would kill Todd was a good guess. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. After a brief pause in the conversation, Joel continued, Damn, Ray Ann, you look great. Have you lost weight? Yes, but that's not what I came here for. What can we do to help you get out of here? A file in the cake might help. Damn, I'm serious. I need you. I want you. Angela interrupted. Even though you're a cheater, thank God the divorce has started. Me? A cheater? Finally, Ray Ann explained. I got a call from a man who claimed that you owed him $300 for sex with a girl named Evie. He threatened to come to our house. She waited for Joel to deny the accusation. You should probably pay up. I don't know what really happened because I was very drunk. You see, my wife went into town when I told her not to. And then she ended up in bed with the one I warned that he was trying to get into her panties. Looks like she really wanted to have fun. Anyway, I was out of my mind, so I don't know what really happened in the motel room. I take back some of what I said. I know that I owe her for the great sex that woke me up. Angela intervened as her sister sat stunned by what she had heard. You're a cheating bastard, and after what your wife went through, I hope you rot in prison. Joel answered calmly. I know that my reaction to your situation was not supportive enough. You already know my excuse. I ultimately came to the conclusion that you were not entirely to blame. You never lied to me. The only thing I was sure was necessary was to do... This is what Todd deserved revenge. Since you were not in a position to take revenge, and the trial was going too slowly, I decided to avenge you. I didn't tell you because I didn't want you to worry. Please know that I have done everything necessary for you to get all our money that we have now, and what my boss will send from work. You need to divorce me and start a new life. You are still young and very attractive. Another man will be very happy to become your husband and the father of your children. Joel began to cry. Angela chimed in again. So you didn't want to help your wife. You cared so much about your wife that you settled down with an easy girl. You just wanted to beat up her rapist and make sure she got all the money she was entitled to. You can't deceive us. What, what you did was only to ease your conscience. Well, at any rate... I hope you and your conscience will spend a lot of time comforting each other in prison. Angela, shut up. This whole situation is a complete mess. Nothing matters now except getting Joel out of jail as soon as possible. Joel, do you have a good lawyer? As far as possible, at the expense of the state. Public defender? I hope you're not that stupid. I don't want to spend any more money that Ray Ann will need to survive without me. I don't need money to survive. I need you. Well, I think I've caused it a lot of trouble. It will take a while before this case goes to trial. Todd will be in the hospital for a long time. 
Joel couldn't help but smile. Once you send the signed papers to my lawyer, the divorce must be finalized before the end of the trial. This is extremely important so that you can save the money you will need to get by without me. Ray Ann was unhappy with the outcome of the meeting, but ignored Angela's mutterings about how terrible Joel was. The car ride back was silent. Later that day, Ray Ann received another call from a pimp. I heard Joel is in jail. I don't care about your worries. Now you owe me $350. I'll send Big Albert tomorrow. You better have the money. He can do over $350 worth of damage in minutes. I will have money. Cash only. No checks. No police. I understood. Ray Ann went to the bank to withdraw cash. When asked how much she wanted, Ray Ann had an idea. She asked for $1,000. Later that day, she opened the door to find the largest black man she had ever seen standing in front of her. There was no doubt who it was. Give me the money and I'll get out of here. Here's your $350 for... Now it's $400. Ray Ann wasn't surprised. $400. Sorry. It's a pleasure doing business with you. Albert turned to leave. How about we do one more thing? Albert was puzzled. And how could it matter? I'll give you another $500 if you let me talk to Evie for five minutes. Albert thought for a moment, then said, I'll call Tyrell. After a short conversation, Albert said, Show me the money. Ray Ann handed over $500. Albert returned to his phone. Are you busy, baby? No, nothing special tonight. I have a strange woman who says she'll give us $500 if she can talk to you for five minutes. Okay, what's the catch? I don't know, but I give her my phone and take the money. Evie? Yes, what are we talking about? You, uh, served my husband last week. He's the one who didn't pay. Oh, yes, but you just paid, didn't you? Yes. What I wanted to know is what exactly were you and my husband doing that night? Evie hesitated. It probably wouldn't hurt to tell you. Your husband got very drunk. I sometimes rob drunks when the opportunity arises. I was having trouble keeping him under control, so I took him to a motel room I keep in reserve. For clients, we barely made it into the room before he fell on the bed. How lucky, I thought. Anyway, I took out his wallet. Only $23 and not a single credit card. Who doesn't have a credit card today? He had a debit card. I decided to wait until he woke up, convince him that we had sex, and then go to the ATM and get cash. In the meantime, I could get some sleep at night. I stripped him naked to convince him that we had sex, and so that he wouldn't be able to escape immediately after he woke up. The next morning, I started to get nervous, waiting for him to wake up. Well, I gave him the pleasure of waking up. He didn't remember anything before, so I told him we had sex and he owed me money. We were walking to the ATM when he ran away from me. I was ready. I had his driver's license. He can pick them up for $50, by the way. Well, you know the rest. The next time Ray Ann came to visit Joel in prison, she told him that she knew he didn't really want the divorce but was doing it to make sure she got all the money. She said they could get married again as soon as he got out. Joel's reaction was completely different from their last visit. Ray Ann, I can't believe you still don't understand. Evie was just the latest woman I slept with. Do you think I was really that upset about you sleeping with Todd? I didn't care. Because I myself have been having sex on the side for many years. The fact that he drugged you made me angry. You should have the right to choose the men you sleep with. But it should be a conscious choice, not a choice under the influence. Perhaps I got a little carried away. Oh, well, I'm ready to move on even if you're not. With the divorce, I'll be able to find a new woman to marry after I get out. Not sure what type of woman would want me, but I doubt I'll be able to find anyone as stupid as you are. You need to find a new man. If you wait for me, you'll become an old, worn-out bitch like your sister. Joel stood up to go back to his cell. Ray Ann was left in tears. As soon as Joel returned to his cell, his tears began to flow. One of Joel's predictions came true. Their divorce was finalized before the trials were over. Todd's trial was the first. Despite the evidence, he declared his innocence. His main goal seemed to be to humiliate Ray Ann. She testified first. 
Between bouts of crying, she described the events of the evening before she left the bar and after she woke up the next morning. Todd's lawyer questioned her harshly. Mrs. Miller, on the night in question, was this the first time you went out to a bar with your colleagues? Yes. Was the reason you didn't go earlier was because your husband was on a business trip and you hoped he wouldn't find out? Well, yes. You see, Your Honor, I will ask the witness to answer only what I ask. Mrs. Miller, please limit yourself to answering the questions asked. Your lawyer will give you the opportunity to say whatever you want. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Yes, my husband threatened Todd because Todd kept trying to press himself against me and put his hands on my butt while we were dancing. I did everything I could to prevent Todd from getting his hands on me. So your best attempt to prevent Mr. Hargrove's inappropriate actions was so weak that your husband had to intervene and threaten Mr. Hargrove. What you are telling us is that you did not want Mr. Hargrove to stop what he was doing as much as your husband and that you were looking forward to inappropriate behavior without your husband present to stop you from engaging in inappropriate behavior. Isn't that right? No, that's not true. I just wanted to dance. Todd is a good dancer. I thought I could keep him under control. A lot of people were watching. So you danced innocently with Mr. Hargrove. Tell us, Mrs. Miller, did your breasts touch his chest at any point during your dance? It happens when you slow dance. Todd's lawyer looked like he was going to ask the judge for help again. Ray Ann quickly said, Yes. At some point during your dance, were you rubbing against Mr. Hargrove? Ray Ann sighed before saying, Yes. Did this last more than a few seconds? Yes. Since you didn't stop rubbing, you must not have considered it inappropriate. Is it because you enjoyed it? Ray Ann stopped trying to seem like she had done nothing wrong. Yes, I liked it. But that didn't mean I wanted to have sex with him. I didn't want it to go any further. You mean on the dance floor? Anywhere. What happened later was not what I wanted. That remains to be seen. Let's move forward in time. Your colleagues have come to the conclusion that it is time to leave. The women all went to the restroom one last time. You, however, did not go with them. I didn't know they were going to leave so soon. I stayed because Todd said he needed to talk to me. Like I said, you didn't go to the bathroom with them. Ray Ann said irritably to the judge, Your Honor, if he's going to ask and answer questions, why should I be here? There was laughter and smiles in the hall. The judge even smiled. Remember, your lawyer will get his chance, too. Todd's lawyer relented. I understand this is stressful for you, Mrs. Miller. I just have a couple of questions. So, we stopped with you and Mr. Hargrove remaining seated at the table while the others went to the restroom. You stated in a previous deposition that Mr. Hargrove wanted to talk about some business matters. Did anyone else hear what you two were talking about? No, as far as I know. So as far as anyone other than you and Mr. Hargrove knows, you could be talking about anything, like what you'd like to do to Mr. Hargrove if you could get rid of the others. This is wrong. So you say, but let's see what your actions say. The others left, you went to the toilet, came back and had another drink with the man you say you were wary of. Pretty soon you were feeling depressed and horny. Laboratory results indicate that you took some sexual stimulants. You later had sex with Mr. Hargrove at your home. What we don't know. How did the substances get into your system? But what we do know is that you voluntarily drank alcohol and you stayed with Mr. Hargrove when the others left? Tell me, isn't it true that you, Mrs. Miller, gave yourself substances to enhance the pleasure of a sexual encounter that you had planned in advance? This is funny. I don't even know where to get such drugs. Todd's lawyer grinned. Mrs. Miller, have you lived in this area long? Ray Ann stopped trying to seem like she had done nothing wrong. Yes, I liked it, but that didn't mean I wanted to have sex with him. I didn't want it to go any further. You mean on the dance floor? Anywhere. What happened later was not what I wanted. That remains to be seen. Let's move forward in time. Your colleagues have come to the conclusion that it is time to leave. The women all went to the restroom one last time. You, however, did not go with them. I didn't know they were going to leave so soon. I stayed because Todd said he needed to talk to me. Like I said, you didn't go to the bathroom with them. 
Ray Ann said irritably to the judge. Your Honor, if he's going to ask and answer questions, why should I be here? There was laughter and smiles in the hall. The judge even smiled. Remember, your lawyer will get his chance too. Todd's lawyer relented. I understand this is stressful for you, Mrs. Miller. I just have a couple of questions. So, we stopped with you and Mr. Hargrove remaining seated at the table while the others went to the restroom. You stated in a previous deposition that Mr. Hargrove wanted to talk about some business matters. Did anyone else hear what you two were talking about? No, as far as I know. So as far as anyone other than you and Mr. Hargrove knows, you could be talking about anything, like what you'd like to do to Mr. Hargrove if you could get rid of the others. This is wrong. So you say, but let's see what your actions say. The others left, you went to the toilet, came back and had another drink with the man you say you were wary of. Pretty soon you were feeling depressed and horny. Laboratory results indicate that you took some sexual stimulants. You later had sex with Mr. Hargrove at your home. What we don't know. How did the substances get into your system? But what we do know is that you voluntarily drank alcohol and you stayed with Mr. Hargrove when the others left. Tell me, isn't it true that you, Mrs. Miller, gave yourself substances to enhance the pleasure of a sexual encounter that you had planted in advance? This is funny. I don't even know where to get such drugs. Todd's lawyer grinned. Mrs. Miller, have you lived in this area long? All my life. Have you ever heard of an area called Irish Town? Yes. What do you know about Irish Town? This is a high crime area. What types of crimes? Theft, robbery, gambling, illegal substances, and probably more. So you know they sell illegal drugs there, forced sex drugs. Are you still saying you don't know where to buy it? I suppose you can buy them there, but I've never bought anything there or anywhere else. Again, you say one thing, and just a few questions reveal that you are changing your statements to something else. Before the prosecution's lawyer could object, Todd's lawyer said, Dismissed. I'm completely done with this witness. The prosecutor did everything she could to restore confidence in Ray Ann and her story, but she saw the jury's eyes on her. For the first time, she feared that Todd might be acquitted. For the first time, she began to understand how anyone, especially her husband, could be at least partly to blame for getting into this situation. She originally wanted Joel to be in court to support her. Now she was glad he wasn't there. Todd's testimony was a key point for the defense. Everything was based on his acting ability. He maintained his innocence in the events of that party. He stated that he initially avoided dancing with Ray Ann due to a conflict at the Christmas party, but as the evening progressed and he had a few drinks, he finally agreed to dance with her, but only because she asked him to. Although he tried to keep her away from him, he eventually gave in. No man could control his excitement, he said, Everything was still fine until she decided to use the ladies' room after all the other women had left. He waited and waited. The others said they had to leave. He finally said he would take her home. When she returned, she learned that the others had already left. She said she was glad because she was sure Todd would give her a ride home. They left almost immediately, and Ray Ann began to show signs of drunkenness. As soon as they got into the car... Ray Ann approached him and started touching him, despite his protests. She begged him to stop at her house for a glass of wine. Wild but mutually consensual sex ensued throughout the night. Ray Ann decided what positions they would try, and how many times they would try each one. He speculated that she might have taken the drugs while she was in the bathroom. In the morning, she became angry when he said that he would not agree to continue their relationship even after her husband returned. She became furious and threatened to accuse him of taking her without consent. He took her threat seriously, which is why he ran away. Todd stated that he was afraid that Joel would attack him if he believed Ray Ann's story. He said that, unfortunately, he was right. He claimed that he was not actually afraid of the police because he had not done anything illegal. The prosecution countered Todd's testimony with testimony from other office workers at Barney's and letters of reprimand in his personnel file for inappropriate comments and contacts with female employees. 
Todd focused on a couple of female jurors, trying to charm them with his poor selves. He only needed to convince one thing. After three days of deliberations, the jury could not reach a consensus. Todd was released. Almost immediately, he filed a civil lawsuit against Joel. Joel's trial for his actions against Todd was quite short. The prosecution presented numerous close-up photographs of the physical injuries Joel inflicted on Todd. This turned out to be excessive. After the first few photos, the jury seemed to begin to ignore the rest. Little attention was paid to the illegal detention because Todd was already unable to go anywhere other than the hospital due to his injuries. There was a surprise on charges of terroristic threats. Several police officers testified that they did not feel threatened and made the call to his hometown police because his request to call seemed reasonable. The prosecution did not seem upset that they received only an eight-year sentence. With credit for time already served, Joel could be released after three years if he was of good behavior. The law's wheat was settled shortly thereafter. Joel's assets were almost zero. Most of them went to Ray Ann as a result of divorce. The judge did not give in to Todd's lawyer's persuasion to take the money away from Ray Ann. Todd had enough money left over to leave town and start a new life elsewhere. This time he drove further away and hid better. Yeah, he always turned off the TV when the publisher's clearinghouse commercial came on. The next three years passed slowly for Joel. He had no contact with Ray Ann other than her sending him birthday and Christmas cards. No signatures or letters inside. It was as if Joel remained on the list of people to send cards to and was never removed. He hated them. Joel wanted to be ready to move on with his life after prison. These cards took him back in time and forced him to fight the mental battle again. The day he left prison, he wondered if anyone would be there to greet him. His last wish was for the one who came. Angela, why are you here? Are you going to run over me? Don't think I don't want this. I'm here because my kind-hearted sister wants to make sure you have a chance at a new life without her. By the way, she's doing well now. Don't you dare let her down. Are you taking me to the half house? No. Ray Ann paid six months' rent for the apartment. This should give you a chance to pull yourself together, find a job, and become independent. What makes you think I'd want an apartment? You may be a bastard, but I don't think you're that stupid. If you don't like it... I'll take you to a luxurious half-house. Okay, but this better not be a joke. As much as I would like to deceive you and hang it on you. Make up your mind. I said I'd go. Then he whispered, Bitch. I heard it. She smiled. Bastard. Angela pulled up to a decent-looking apartment complex. Joel commented, They look too expensive for me. They're cheaper than you think. At least come inside and then we can talk about the costs. Joel was shown into a two-room apartment. She was very nice. Despite the certainty that he wouldn't be able to afford it any time soon, he wanted to see every room. He began to notice that some of the furniture was from his old house. Angela noticed his gaze. Ray Ann did a little decorating. She used some things she replaced in your old house. After inspection, Joel said, it's very nice compared to where I lived, but I still don't see how I can afford it. I'll have to earn almost as much as I did before to pay the rent. There's no chance I can get such a good job now being a convicted felon. Why not? Angela broke out into a big smile. Your old boss is waiting for you at work. The salary is a little less than what you had before. You better not mess with me. I swear on your grave. I'm not dead yet, bitch. Give me time. Give me time. Isn't there a cheaper one-room apartment? I forgot to say one of these bedrooms is for your flatmate. Roommate? Yes, we decided that you would need help paying for this place, so... Ray Ann entered the apartment. Look here, neighbor. Let's get some things straight. We're not married anymore. That means it's all in half. Utilities and responsibilities. This is your bedroom, and this is mine. Under no circumstances do you enter my bedroom if we... We both don't want this. And there will be no other women in your bedroom if it's not me. Is everything clear? Joel was set up. It was a nice setup, but a setup. Didn't I make it clear enough earlier than that? Ray Ann walked up to him and hugged him. 
You made it clear that you wanted me to have a good life no matter what. I knew you did it to help me because you thought you'd be gone too long to matter. I let you think that I'm doing what you asked so you don't worry. You really think we'll get married again, don't you? No. We're actually divorced. Ray Ann sighed. Joel, a lot of water has passed under the bridge. A lot of dirty water. There's still a lot of talking and forgiveness between us, both ways. That's why we'll start with separate bedrooms. So this is an offer, if you prefer, a half house. After a few minutes of thinking, Joel's face suddenly became sad. Joel, what's wrong? I'm afraid there's something you don't know that could change everything. Ray Ann's face became sullen. What is it, Joel? Well, I was in prison for almost four years. I know you understand that there are no women in prison, and that men still want to have sex. Oh no, have you had sex with men? No, but given the circumstances, it seems that I prefer men now. Ray Ann and Angela both sank down onto the couch. Both were silent. We've been through so much to make this happen. Tears rolled down their faces. I have another revelation. In fact, I lied about liking men. Gotcha. Both women physically attacked him while he laughed harder than he had ever laughed before. They soon joined in the laughter. Angela said, You bastard. You just added another thing to the list of things my sister needs to forgive you for. Ray Ann added, Keep that in mind when you decide how soon you want to be intimate again. Now I'm ready to offer you in bed what Evie told me you liked. Is your sister going to join us? A pillow from the sofa flew straight at his head. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.